Well, good morning. Welcome, good morning. everyone. Uh, our speaker today is Mark Warren, whose Medicine Bow Wilderness School is outside Dahlonega in the Chattahoochee Nas National Forest. Uh, Med Medicine Bow is a primitive school of earth lore, which I hope Mark will tell us a little bit about this morning. Having done a little paneling myself, uh, I was interested to know that Mark is a U.S. champion whitewater canoeist, and he also won the World Championship Longboat title in 1999. He's authored many books on his work as a naturalist, including uh, the, the uh, Secrets of the Forest series, which uh, we have, we have uh, those up front uh, for those who would like them. Uh, and he's also written a fictional series on Wired Earp, and other Western books. His Wild Plants and Survival Lore has been selected for our October book club meeting. Uh, today, he'll be talking to us on the ancient ways of the Cherokee and how we can use them today. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, for the Thank you, uh, Mr. Is this set up now for me? To... Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sleeping at the switch here. You know, all the little pockets of forests that we still have, and Atlanta has quite a bit. Um, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have flown over Atlanta. And it's really a different scenery, isn't it, from most cities? There's so many trees here, especially in this part of town. Lee, can you hide everyone's video? Everyone turn their video off. And those little pockets of forest are are very close to looking like the way forests once looked before the white man came here from Europe. Uh, there are some changes. Uh, for example, where I live in the mountains up near Dahlonega, the, the most dramatic change would be the absence of the chestnut tree, which I was doing tree still happened. Uh, the blight venient nuts, easy to uh, extract, and full of nutrition. So that's a big change. Uh, there are, are other things I could mention like that, but the probably the, the next biggest change would be the things that are here now that don't really belong here, the non-native plants. And some of them have kind of uh, you know, Americanized in a kind way. Uh, but some of them are are quite rude, <laughs> like privet, like uh, honeysuckle, and of course the arch enemy of all the South, kudzu, <laughs> which literally smothers entire forests. So those are big changes. But my point is, you can step into a little pocket of forest and still be connected to the history of what our forests were like. And what we're going to look at today is how the people who once lived here, who were native, how they saw this forest, how they used individual parts of it, and they knew things about the forest that our society simply doesn't know anymore, unless you're a specialist in that. Uh, we now, unfortunately, have a tremendous distance between human and the backdrop of nature. Nature is basically seen as a picture now by most people, and it's not understood, and therefore it's uh, feared in some ways, and that fear is passed along to children. One of my big missions is to get children in love with the forest so that they want to go back and they can eventually create literal relationships with plants, because as soon as you use a plant, as say a medicine or an insect repellent or a food, you are intimate with it. I mean, there, there's no way to get more intimate than to eat something really. Think about the times you've held a baby in your arms and said, oh, I could eat you up. You know, that's, <laughs> don't do that. But that's the ultimate uh, expression of loving something because of uh, the nutrition that it's gonna give you. These things are all still usable. And the things that I'm gonna share with you today have been backed up by modern scientific research. 
Now that's not to say that our scientific research is the ultimate word on everything because the native people have been teaching us for centuries things that we are just now accepting, such as the communication of trees underground, which is a, a relatively new <coughs> facet to our science, but it is it's fascinating. And if you're not familiar with that, I highly encourage you to read a book called Finding the Mother Tree by Suzanne Simard. Uh, it's all about how trees share materials and communicate with one another underground. We already knew they communicated above ground by way of chemicals. Now there's a, there's a whole network under the earth that we never get to see unless we dig for it. And it's truly interesting. You would love it. And as, as master gardeners, I think it's almost required reading for you to, to really understand more about the plant world. What's the name of the book again? Finding the Mother Tree. Suzanne. Suzanne Simard. We read uh, in our book club, um, um, Hidden Life of Trees. Thank you very much. Peter, Peter Wallenberg, another great book. Yeah. yeah. He's based in Europe and he's uh, a forester yeah. there. Suzanne Simard is Canadian, a little, little closer okay. to us. But, but her, her groundwork on this exploration into the soil is fascinating. And uh, She's a woman. She's going against this bureaucratic male system, being uh, ridiculed all the way, and now she's standing on the top. You know, and people are embarrassed that they ever said they what they did to her. Well, let's jump right into some um, fire creation. Is a magical thing to see. It it may be the the one true magic trick that I know. When you can elicit fire from pieces of dead wood, there's no better. Uh, audience thing that you can do because uh, it looks like fire just comes out of thin air but fire plays such an important part in the medicines especially that we'll talk about and the foods because a lot of the foods do need to be cooked uh, for example one of the foods that i'll we'll give away today to somebody if they'd like to get it started in their garden plot is lamb's quarters which is has been thought to be European for a long, long time, but an archeologist found stored seeds of this in the 16th century, which is maybe far enough back to suggest since they were stored seeds that this was pre-Columbian. So lamb's quarters may have existed here. So we won't peg that as, a, as an invasive, but it's a wonderful food. When you cook it, it it gets rid of the oxalic acid, which could be problematic to some people. So cooking is important. The fire is, of course, the, the real foundation of all of that. Fire just changed everything. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is a contributor to fire. The plant, anytime I'm making a fire in the forest up in the mountains, my go-to not working. My go-to plant for the very first thing, would you play here? I just put okay. it right here. All right. Is it the is. white pine. I'll bet you're all familiar with, uh, you know that pines have unusual leaves. that We call them needles. Are you aware of how different pines cluster their needles together in different numbers? Most pine trees are twos and threes. What I'm saying is you might have three needles sheathed in a little sleeve, a, a little barky piece that's called the fascicle. This is our only tree in the Southeast that has five needles per bundle. So it's easy to figure out what tree that is. It's also called mountain pine that get, tells you where it likes to grow. And every pine tree loves to make every now and then what's called a whorl, W-H-O-R-L, of branches. That means branching that's making kind of like spokes of a wheel, you know, all even at one layer, but the white pine only makes whorls. So you can count their layers up and see uh, that it is a white pine. So look for repetitive whorls for this. Now here's the wonderful thing about pines. They make this chemical called terpene. That's T-E-R-P-E-N-E. 
And though the spelling's a little different, it's the basis of turpentine, which is T-U-R. But terpenes are highly flammable. And even the dead wood of white pine, and every white pine holds on to its dead branches down low. The tree gives up on those branches purposely in order to put more energy into the new branching that's closer to the sun, has more availability of sunlight. So it lets the lower branches die, but the branches remain on the trunk of the tree for a long, long time. The terpenes are still in there. So the limbs evaporate all their water, leaving this highly flammable chemical inside. There is the best kindling you could ask for. And it does tiniest little branchlets all around the bottom of some white pine to have a fistful of those. And if you apply one match flame to that, here we're talking just the, you know, the typical making a fire with a match. Put a match flame to that and you're gonna have a flame about two and a half feet high. It's that volatile. So that's what gets your fire going beautifully. So wonderful gift here in the white pine. Pines are also one of the edible plants. And here I'm talking about a layer called the inner bark. Everybody's familiar with the outer bark of trees. On this little branch of white pine that's on our picture, you're looking at outer bark there. I've carved away outer bark. That's why you're seeing green there. That little green is a one cell thick layer called cambium. And the rest of that bulk that you see, that's actually about an eighth of an inch thick, this little strip that's pulled up. That's called the inner bark. And the inner bark's purpose is it serves as conduits to carry down the tree what the leaves make. And here's an important part of that. And this is so important that I, I hope you'll latch onto this and remember it. All trees divide their chemicals up in their leaves and send down only certain chemicals to the bottom of the tree, to the roots, which need all kinds of things like, like energy which the leaves have captured from sunlight. Also, they need foods and they need certain chemicals such as antibiotics and like salicin, something like that. So these are all traveling down and that layer that you see just peeled off of that little branch, that's a layer of that inner bark showing you that one cell thick layer of cambium that's right on top of it. Well, that's considered an edible survival food but there's one problem and the books just seem to never tell you this for some reason. Terpenes are in it. And terpenes being very, very flammable, it gives you an idea that there's a potency there. Well, that's really hard on our mucosa, our whole stomach. And it can quickly give you an upset stomach if you were to eat much of that. And I don't know why books don't mention that. I guess it's lack of experience from the writer. But now you know, it's got to be heated up to drive the terpenes out. You could simply do that by taking that strip of bark, setting it aside somewhere, putting a rock on your hot coals that you've created, and let it put your rock on that and let that heat up the rock. Uh, get a Y-shaped stout stick to use as a spatula and flip that rock over and heat the other side and now drag it out of there. And you've got a little radiating oven there for a while. You can just lay that bark right on top of the rock and it'll drive the terpenes out. And then you've got, listen to this list, iron, phosphorus, carbohydrates, protein, fat, vitamins B1, 2, and 3, vitamin C, vitamin A. That's a good list of nutrients that we all appreciate. How, how much fiber in there? Well, this starts off feeling like wood when you start chewing it, soft wood. And then after about two minutes, it feels like chewing gum. And after about two more minutes, it feels like it's breaking apart. And then you instinctively know when to swallow it. Will you like it? Probably not. Because uh, there, there will be a, a little terpene residue left in there and it's a terpentiny taste. It's not barbecued potato chips. <laughs> but when you're eating in the wild, 
you have to have a little shift of your mindset so that you are eating for nutrition. And believe me, when you make that shift, there's an appreciation that develops in you. You stop demanding taste so much. And what you're begging for is the nutrition. If you don't, you know, just the protein in the pine inner bark is worth talking about. If you can't find protein, you know, people always talk about you're in that classic survival situation, your plane crash in the Andes, whatever. That's probably not going to happen to you. But some small phase of that could happen to you pretty easily. Maybe you might have to stay overnight somewhere where you weren't expecting it because of a car breakdown in a remote area. That's very probable. And, you know, people have those experiences and die these days. Even having a car there is a shelter. But having a little portion of survival skill knowledge could be uh, just invaluable to you in certain situations. But this inner bark heated, driving the terpenes out, you've got a rich source of these nutrients that I named. And so it's worthwhile to eat. Now you can disguise this. You can do it the way we do our foods today. I mean, very few people eat things completely raw unless it's a fruit perhaps, you know, we, we spice things up and you can do that with this. You could take a hundred strips like that and then even cut them into smaller strips, soak them in salt water for three hours and then wash them off real well, boil that and you have pasta. Serve that with whatever you serve with your pasta and you would be quite pleased with it. The creation of fire is by using pieces of dead wood, or in this case, dead wood, this happens to be white pine, which you saw. And this is the winter remnant of a, what you would call a weed. I found that any of the wooden remnants of the so-called weeds that still stand in the winter, those that are strong enough to stand up to this kind of work, they all work, but every tree doesn't. White pine is one of the trees that does work. The native people who lived north of the Chattahoochee and up where I live, the Cherokee, had a beautiful name for trees in general. They call them the standing people. And for centuries, writers have been talking about that as, well, that's because trees stand so tall. In fact, that white pine that you saw, that's the tallest type of tree in the Eastern United States. And it goes all the way up the Appalachians. You know, it's the state tree of Maine. I say that it's not that, but it's what the native people knew about trees. They knew so much more than we gave them credit for and still do. And that is that trees stand in one place. They don't move around, they stand. What else can do that in terms of wildlife? Just the plants. What are all wild animals doing 95% of their waking life in search of something, aren't they? Maybe trying to find something or trying not to be found. Movement, always, but that's what's so unique about the plant world. You know, this planet runs on energy that comes from the sun. Every move you make, whether it's folding your arms across your body or blinking or sprinting a hundred meters or climbing a tree or just talking, you're using energy from the sun. How did you get it? You cannot get it directly. We have an agent who does that for us. We have a middleman slash middle woman, the greenery of the world. They capture energy from light. We don't get to see that, do we? So it's easy to forget. That's the miracle equation of life on earth right there. It's what runs this planet. I'm not talking about the spinning of the planet. That's momentum that's been set up. It's going to last a long time. I'm talking about all the energy that's fired in, on this planet, whether it's fired inside a cell in your body or inside a uh, a chamber in your automobile. Every bit of that comes from the sun. Think about it. And we have these agents here working for us. 
to capture that energy here, or we wouldn't have it. Something's got to burst into flame here. These two items never catch on fire. These make friction. What you've got to have to catch on fire is something very fine and filamentous, like beat up pine needles. That's exactly what that is there. Those are part of a great treasure that I pick up every November at a certain intersection in Atlanta, which I will not divulge. <laughs> but I'll be the guy out there dodging traffic with the trash bag in my hand, picking up in five minutes, a whole year of teaching classes on this. That's called the tinder. So that comes from the tree. Who knows this tree? Anybody familiar with it? Okay, before you, before you uh, commit a sacrilege and say that word, <clears throat> this starts with a P, P-O-P-L-A-R. This is not a poplar. And I'm hoping that you folks today will uh, join my crusade to make this tree called what it's supposed to be called. The Forest Service calls it the tulip P. I'm not, I don't even want to say the word. <laughs> not, not that I have anything against poplars because I don't. Poplars have edible inner bark. This tree does not. You see where I'm headed? This is a magnolia. The tulip what? magnolia. Tulip magnolia. Absolutely. And guess what was the first tree in the history of the earth to create a flower? The magnolia. We know that by studying the genetics of plants. So it changed the world. The flower changed the world. Before that, when there were fern trees and spores were flying places, the spores were at the mercy of the wind. And with flowers, you now had Every flower had its own UPS system to come pick up and deliver. We call them insects. You know, those nasty things that bother us? Insects. The tulip tree, which is its nickname, easier to say, is so unique because look at that leaf. Follow that midrib vein. Look what it ends in, a notch. The complete opposite of what all the other leaves end in, which is either a point or a rounded point. The complete opposite. There's no way you cannot identify this tree in the green season. It's one of our most common trees. Here's a dead one, a dead branch that I broke over my knee. And what's hanging off of here, see, there's the bare branch. What's hanging off of here is the inner bark and the outer bark that I peeled off of there. And look how the, the, the branch usually breaks into three pieces almost every time. That's kind of a trademark of it. It's a very brittle piece of wood because it's so light and it's so light because it's so porous. Now, you're looking at dead inner bark and that is almost a miracle to be looking at that because the first thing trees lose when they die are the wettest parts. And the reason for that is that Everything that rots dead stuff in the forest, that's the bacteria that travels by water. So wet things are gonna rot first. You, you already know this instinctively. You know that when you see a log on the ground, if you roll it over, you're gonna see a more rotten bottom, aren't you? So only because the water's there, and that's the inroad for the bacteria. But you're looking here at dead bark and living bark here. Look what you can make from living bark. This is what the native people taught us. Only at the springtime can you cut a slab of bark off of the tulip tree and peel it off to use it for something. This is one rectangle of bark, which was this long. And right in the middle of it, I scored this, what looks like a very slender football shape so that the outer bark has a slice in it, but the inner bark doesn't. And that's where it bends to come back around to itself, lace it up with inner bark, strengthen its lip with a, a stave of a hickory branch. I keep forgetting. <laughs> uh, this is 
But this is not something you could walk into a high school these days and present to a class, you know, as your program, get people excited. <laughs> because our, our world is full of containers. You're wearing some containers right now. I mean, your clothes contain you, but you've got pockets, you've got purses, you've got backpacks, cardboard boxes, which are made from trees. In your home, you've got thousands of containers. Count your pillowcases. What about that drawer in the kitchen where all the grocery bags end up? What about all the Ziplocs? Containers are everywhere now. I have no doubt that we could walk out on the road there and find some container in the gutter, maybe a McDonald's fries container, who knows? But containers are, are just everywhere in our life. We're flooded with them. In the old days, a container was such an important possession. If you've ever gone out to really forage and collect a lot of stuff, you learn quickly that your hands fill up so fast. Mm -hmm. And you need something to carry things in and to protect those things. I made this basket about 35 years ago. Excuse me, Mark, but we can't see you on, on Zoom. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> I made this about 35 years ago. It's still as tough as it ever was. You're looking at an outer bark there and the inner layer is the inner bark. You can only do this in the spring with this tree. Now, why I said this is a miracle is because the first thing to rot on any tree that goes down is gonna be the inner bark. And that's why, I'll bet you've had this experience before. Have you ever found a branch in the woods and you picked it up and you could just kind of loosen the bark and pull it off like a sleeve? You know why you could do that? Because the inner bark was gone. There was nothing connecting the bark to the sapwood. So it's very unusual for a tree to do this, but the tulip tree does it. I brought a sample up to show you. This is a piece of tulip magnolia bark from a dead trunk. And you're looking at the outer bark and there's the inner bark. It's all coming apart in ribbons now. Now from this piece right here, I wanna make for you just to show you the value of this thing that I'm holding right here. First, I'm gonna take this down to the creek and get it wet. And since Zoom can't go with me, <laughs> I brought the creek. <laughs> One of the most important inventions of humankind is what you're about to see. And it's never mentioned in textbooks. I'm getting this moist and that makes every little fiber in there less brittle, more pliable. Here comes one of the world's most important inventions. For those of you who are in the room here, I'll pass this around. If you watch very closely which way my hands are moving <laughs> and which hand goes over the top, I'm sure you all know what this is by now. If you could get a close look at it, excuse me, Zoomers. Look familiar? Hi. There's Hi. still twine that's sold like this in this pattern. This is a double helix, like DNA. It's a highly praised piece of architecture. But what I'm making here is a piece of string or thin rope. Now, why is that so important? Why is that one of the most important items ever created by humans. Well, let me tell you what's taken its place, the carpenter's nail. This is how you get two pieces of wood to stay together. 
you lash it. That's the first carpenter's nail right there. Okay, here's a little science fiction thriller for you. Imagine we had the power, maybe it's a Harry Potter thing. Imagine we had the power to wave a wand and every nail in the world disappeared. <laughs> Picture Atlanta. <laughs> Easy to take for granted, huh? It's like a match. What's a match cost? A match once destroyed Atlanta back in the 1860s, remember that? <laughs> Anybody here? <laughs> I just miss it. All right, I'm going to leave it half done and half undone so that you can kind of compare before and after. So I'll just pass this around, test it out a little bit. It's not our strongest fiber by any means, but it's very usable now. <laughs> Wouldn't peg, pegs came a, a lot a lot later pegs came a lot later but that you know the using the dowels in the holes is a beautiful solution to that yeah and, and did the indians use that a lot no they used fittings and then wrapped it they would cut things to fit like the amish do but not the pegs this is North America's strongest plant fiber, made the same way, but this time, instead of from inner bark, it's made from a leaf, and the plant is yucca. You know that one? Here's another gift of the tulip tree. This is what the Cherokees made their dugout canoes from. Of course, this is a scale model. I have to say that because there was one time when after the program, somebody asked me, how big were those Cherokee? <laughs> but uh, here's how, here's, here's the process. I want you to appreciate the process of making a boat in those days. We don't have the tree here, the type of birch tree that was used up in the North Country to make birch bark canoes. So we made dugout, I say we, like I'm a Cherokee. <laughs> the people here, whom I have studied, made it from this very porous, very buoyant, rather soft hardwood called the tulip magnolia. And first they would have to down the tree. So if you can picture this as a, <clears throat> as a living tree, it's got to go down and land on other trees to keep it off the earth so it won't rot. And then once it's down, got to debark it. And believe me, with a living tree, that's a, that's a job. Took a lot of people to work on that. And we're talking about a section that would end up, a canoe might be as long as from where I am to the wall there. There were different lengths, but there were some that accommodated a crew of people to work on things. So the tree is down and then it's got to dry out a bit before work can be done on it. But the first work was building a fire on top. And even though I don't know this for a fact, I can tell you without any hesitation, it was white pine twigs that were put up here first to get things going and then add other things that would burn longer. But once that fire burns itself out along the top, then you take a tool. Today would be something like an ads, a chipping tool. It looks kind of like a garden hoe. And you would chip out the charred wood. A lot easier to chip out charred wood than, <clears throat> than uncharred wood. So then you've got a little bit of a cavity there. Now you fill that with kindling, burn it again. Then you chip it out some more. And that's the dugout canoe. So this was made exactly in that way by burning out. And then finally a stone was used to smooth it out inside. But this gives you an idea. So it's a very stable boat too. The Cherokees suffered from two maladies that are particular to their ethnicity. Um, you, you already know of some uh, that I wasn't gonna get into. For example, we hear a lot about how Native Americans are very prone to alcoholism. It's a genetic thing. And they're also very prone to diabetes. And when they were thrown into the life of the whites, you know, you can imagine how that hit their culture in, in so many negative ways, and that was one of them. 
but two of the things that they always suffered from was they they made a lot of stones in their body bladder stones gall stones kidney stones and so as you and by the way i have never seen that in the book but what i see is there are so many uh, cures for stones that they tried and this one is probably the best this is called pipsisawa now that's an algonquin word that comes up from the new york area but translated it means breaks apart the stone mm -hmm. pipsisawa is very common here you can look for it in pine and hardwood forest it's an evergreen it grows its leaves in whorls remember that word and the uh, the teeth along the edge are impressive when, as you rub them with your thumb, much stiffer than your average leaf. Uh, if you happen to know uh, dog hobble, which is a fetter bush, uh, very tough teeth along the edge, similar to this. This was uh, just a wonderful dissolver of stones. Stones form in different ways, and one of those is oxalic acid and the the forests of the south are full of oxalic acid that lamb's quarter is full of oxalic acid when you cook that it takes care of that problem for you but uh, oxalic acid when in the body of a person who's prone to make stones and there's probably somebody in this room we're not going to call for a show of hands <laughs> but somebody you at least know somebody i'll bet and uh, I've never had a stone in my life, I'm so glad to say, but I was once hired to go to a man's property in my county and teach him about his land. And when I walked in his house, he had a shelf in his den that I thought was stored beans that he was keeping for the next. Then I got closer and thought, no, maybe that's pea gravel, but why does he have it in jars like this? This guy made a stone every two months of his life since he was 10 years old. He was 47 when I met him. So he had a real problem. And uh, the first thing we did was go out and find Pipsis Wild on his property. It grows in little colonies. At first you don't notice that when you see one, just start looking around several feet away. You're gonna find a few others near there. So we would take just a couple of leaves from each colony until he had a nice little bundle and we tied it together with a piece of yarn and we tacked it up inside his house in a doorway where there was ventilation but no direct sunlight and in two weeks he had dried pipsisawa leaves the next time this fellow felt the beginning formation of a stone and this guy was probably the world expert on that wouldn't you say yeah he made the tea with the leaves it's one teaspoon that's why we get this word teaspoon of dried powdered leaves into one cup of hot water stir that up he had one cup of that in the morning and one in the evening he repeated that the next day he made no stones and he's made no more stones since then and that i met him 15 years ago so here's a guy that went from making a stone every two months to none at all because of this plant Like so, so is, that, is that prevalent throughout North Georgia? It's, it's all over yeah, our park and all over North Georgia, correct. Would you like to pass it around? Sure. That's Pipsisawa. How, how far north does it go? Um, I'm going to guess it goes all the way up the Appalachians, but I, I don't know for certain. I'd have to look up the range. <laughs> River cane. It is our only native cane. There was no bamboo here. But one of the great uses of river cane was for making arrow shafts. More Cherokee arrows were made from river cane than probably any other material. The shaft has to, re has to meet three requirements in archery. A shaft must be light. These are obviously light once they're dried out because they're hollowed except for their septa between chambers. They also need to be very straight. River cane is anything but straight, but it can be straightened by heating it over hot coals 
It's a good winter project to sit by a fire and straighten out a piece of cane. Every section is curved slightly like a banana and every, every two sections are bent from each other because river cane is a grass and all grasses grow zigzag. Let your lawn go for, for several weeks this summer without cutting it. You have, I'll write your note on that so you don't have to mow that lawn. And take a look at the stem of grass. Most people think of grass as just blades sticking out. Grass has stems, you know, and they zigzag as they grow. Stem All star, grasses. Can, can you show us? We we can't see what you're. Thank you so much. So this is a straightened shaft of river cane made into an arrow, and uh, just. Well, how do they Pardon me. Well, imagine I've got a fork in a tree here. Once I heat up my cane, I, I walk over to the fork and I will straighten each bent section. First, get the section straight and then go back and heat the joints and then align the two straight joints to one another. Okay. The bow that was used was made from the what the Cherokees call the yellow locust. Today, it's called the black locust. I don't know why that name was changed, but anybody who's worked with this wood would understand why the Cherokees called it yellow locust. Everybody knows about the rings of trees, but the only time you ever see them is at a saw cut, right? Cross, cross section like this. Are you aware that the rings of trees are actually very long sleeps stacked concentrically upon one another? And when you make a bow, here's a bow made from yellow locust. This is exactly the kind of bow that the Cherokees made. Here's what I want you to think about for a moment. The, the side of the bow facing you right now is called the back of the bow. The side facing me is called the belly. The back of the bow <clears throat> must show one growth ring. Follow, think about that. You're scraping down a piece of wood to reveal one growth ring. And that's the layer that keeps your bow from splitting. Hmm. It's a necessity for making a bow. These days, you don't have to do that making a bow because bow makers now slap on a layer of fiberglass here. All bows today have fiberglass on them. And that's to protect them from splintering. But I, I thought you might enjoy seeing a contribution of the plant world to the hunting world, which was a necessity at that time. And of course, contribution of a bird here. That's a wild turkey. Uh, would you like a great little riddle? And I don't want you to answer it yet. I want you to think about it a while. Why do arrows have feathers on them? <coughs> what about this helps this arrow to be more effective? Just think about it. Why the feathers? That's what I'm asking. Why the feathers? And why put them back here? If you ask any child about that, you'll usually hear, well, it helps them fly, like the bird. But, but the feathers don't really move. Do you? Recognize this? It's just another variation of that berry basket, isn't it? See the little slender football shape? So there's all kinds of possibilities with that. This is my dark quiver. You know, the Cherokees use blowgun. <laughs> and uh, this is to protect darts. And this is a little experiment I did. You notice how these other containers that I have have a, a reinforcement around the lip so that they won't warp. But I made one without that because I wanted them to warp. See how they warped? And that was my experiment in making the first screw on lid. <laughs> that may be the only thing I've ever invented that worked. River cane was just incredibly important, so much so that the Cherokees, you know, we always think of the Native Americans as the ultimate conservationists. Sometimes they burn miles of floodplain to encourage this growth because the real living parts of this are underground. You know, these reproduce by rhizomes. That's an asexual type of reproduction. It's all underground. So the fire burns out everything else and makes space for this. And 
they just use this for so many different crafts. And I think one that's worth taking note of is that it provided music. This is a Cherokee flute. This is actually called a love flute. So I, I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen here when I play this. <laughs> Try to control yourself. <laughs> Sorry, Zoom. <laughs> Anybody feeling emotional? <laughs> what, Mark, what, what is that at the top of the flute? Well, it's a, this is a very <clears throat> impressive invention. It just it blows my mind because this is not all hollow. There is a wall in the cane right here. So if you blew into this end, it wouldn't go anywhere. A hole is burned in, I'll turn it this way, a hole is burned in either side of that wall. And then this is a piece of wood with a groove carved in it so that the air will go in up the first hole and then through the groove. And then this hole here has to be sharpened and where the breath hits that sharpened edge, it splits the air in half. And that's how you make a tone. And you vary the tone by, it's actually as if you were varying the length of the cane by lifting your fingers up. Because every hole that you lift up uh, you, this cane thinks it's that long now, and so it makes a higher pitch. It's just fascinating to think about inventing that. So the end is blocked. Bottom end of it is blocked. <clears throat> it's blocked here. But what about down the other side? No, it's wide open. Okay. It's got to be there, because we need to have that bottom half of the air have an exit, or it wouldn't have worked. Um, you know, we're inundated with music now. Music's everywhere. You can't even get it. It's even on, on hold on the telephone. <laughs> Think about a time when there was no music and somebody brought this to the campfire one night. <clears throat> that would have just blown your moccasins off. <laughs> <laughs> one of the uh, important, I didn't bring uh, any cane matting today, but the Cherokees put a lot of stock in mats to sit on. Can anybody guess why? Anybody ever heard of chiggers? <laughs> That's some dead river cane. And I, I show this because it, it shows you a good uh, illustration of how, whoa. <laughs> Help. Um, River cane has its branches angled higher like that. Bamboo has its branches angled lower. There we go. One more. And one more. What are you pushing? The stone arrow. Okay, thank you. The red maple is the source of a medicine that I've probably used with my students more than any other medicine. And this one is, it's just so beautiful because it will take you from tears to a smile in a matter of seconds. And we're talking here about serious burns. You can take the leaves of red maple, green leaves, put them in any container, heat up water separately, and then pour that water over the leaves. And then you must use a tool to crush it. Green leaves don't automatically diffuse their chemicals out into water because green leaves are full of water. Dried leaves are a different story, right? Put a tea bag in the water and you see the diffusion happen immediately. But green leaves, you need a blunt tool to crush the leaves. And you do that until the water cools. And then you have your medicine takes away the pain within seconds. It also stimulates 
the living cells at the boundary of the burn to start making new cells. This is all research today showing this. It also, when the water evaporates, it leaves a film over the burn. There's your bandage. So to prevent secondary infection, which is a, a common serious problem with serious burns. Uh, I had a physician come to one of my classes and he had a patient who had a horrible burn and he couldn't get the burn to heal completely. He got it about 70% healed and rest wouldn't heal. He tried this and uh, he made up a solution to this, gave it to his patient in a jar, said, lie down twice a day, put a rag in that water, wring it out. Little Little bit on had a burned chest, and uh, it cost effect. Right. Yeah. You can't patent, you can't patent it. Probably. Do you know what's in that? Oh. I don't. I don't. I don't know the chemical. Sassafras is a, a pretty well-known tree um, to most folks because of its wonderful taste of root beer. The root tastes that way, and. Uh, it's always funny to me whenever I share this with children and they're drinking and they're talking about root beer. And finally, it dawns on somebody, root beer. You know, <laughs> that's why it's called that. <laughs> this was the original root beer. And here's what we know about. For centuries, it's been used as a spring tonic because it thins the blood. It prepares you for the hot months of the summer but it boosts the immune system. That's the big thing. And it prevents you from getting those attacks that you might have in spring, say from hay fever or whatever. Um, but it is definitely an immune booster because there is a trace of sephrol in there, which is carcinogenic, not enough to harm us. Uh, for example, when the uh, Surgeon General back in the seventies came out and said, sassafras causes cancer, it is outlawed now. Well, they did such an unfair test. They isolated saffron from all the other chemicals and they pumped it into a rat in quantities until the rat made tumors. And then they put it on the list along with hamburger, you know, the edge of the hamburger that gets blackened and all kinds of things went on the list that year. But here's what we know now that one cup of sassafras tea has one fourteenth the carcinogen of one can of beer, but we're never going to hear about that one. It's in print, but you never hear about it because of lobbyists. That's a powerful lobbying sector in our culture. Here's what we know now about this plan, and this is why it could be a lifesaver. And I mean that literally. We now know that sassafras tea, that very same one that people used to drink and some still do as a spring tonic, kills all the microorganisms in your gut. Now that's a bad thing, right? Yeah. Unless you are besieged with dysentery. Sometimes it's necessary for us to just have a scorched earth program in our gut and then build it back up again, which is pretty easy. You know, if you're working outside, it's going to work. You're going to get dirt on your hands, on your fingers. You're going to get bacteria back in there. Bacteria is good for us. It's meant to be inside of us. But when we need it eradicated because of bad pathogens inside of this, us, this is how to do it. And it could literally save your life. And I know this from a personal experience that I had on um, one of my self-imposed survival trips. I had killed a fish for my meal and I ate half of it one night. I built a little refrigerator over the creek to try to save it overnight to have the second half the next day. And that next day, the smell was questionable. And I was probably young enough then to think to myself, well, I'll try it. I'll just, I'll cook it extra long. And before I ate it though, I made sassafras tea. And I had it sitting by in reserve. I got so sick from that bad fish. I shouldn't call the fish bad. I should call the, from the bad cook's fish. 
I was so sick. I was incapacitated. I could not work. I was lying down. So I reached over and drank that cup of sassafras tea. And in 45 minutes, I was normal doing everything I needed wow. to do. It works that fast. How am I doing on time? Uh, you're about an hour now. Okay. Uh, I never finish this program. Never. <laughs> uh, I would like to uh, to ask you who would like to have lamb's quarters in their garden. Can we raffle it? Sure. With Let's do raffle? that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I almost got it to you. <laughs> do that. And also, uh, <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't get to this, but plantain is such a common, dare I use the word, here I go again. <laughs> Hi, I'm back. <laughs> Broadleaf plantain, the common weed everywhere. It's, it, it's not native. It came from England and, and other parts of Europe, probably came over in the hulls of ships, which were filled with dirt for ballast and then shoveled out over here for some dry docking and repair. This is highly praised by herbalists today as an anti-inflammatory. This is the plant to go to whenever you get a bee sting. It will literally draw the acid out of you so that it stops burning you. It's, it's the best bee sting remedy we've got. Do you crush the leaf? Or? That's right. Yeah. Um, I should end up with this. I'm going to sacrifice one leaf from this plant so I can show you something about it. So you can be sure to recognize, to recognize broadleaf plantain. First notice the vein pattern. It's the oldest vein pattern on the planet. It's called parallel veins. Veins run side by side, okay? All right, so there's that. There is no stem with leaves coming off of it. All the leaves come from the top of the root. All right, so that's two things. Here's the third. If you very, very patiently, and I mean underline very, if you gently try to disengage the leaf stalk from the leaf, you can literally pull the veins right out of the leaf. I'm pulling them right now. I'm seeing five veins that I'm pulling out right now. I, I doubt that you can see it in the audience, but boy, you lucky people in Zoom. There it is. There's about an eighth of an inch there between the leaf stalk and the leaf. So this would this is an edible, and you get the infl the anti-inflammatory uh, activity just from eating it. Just like with ginger root, isn't that something you can get a medicine by eating? Usually we have to manipulate in some way, often tone it down so it's not so concentrated. So our body doesn't close off to it. But this is, you just eat it, you're getting anti-inflammatory work. It is a good enough poultice to use for anything that's subcutaneous like a yellow jacket sting, a hornet, a bumblebee. But snake bite, you can't expect this to work because that's just too deep. That's intramuscular, but you should eat the leaf because it's anti-inflammatory and that's going to help you with a snake bite. We're talking, of course, about venomous snake bites, right? So if you can, uh, I'll pass this around too. <clears throat> if you can pull, expose the veins like that, you've got the correct plan. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? I one. Yes. I heard you can make uh, very nutritious tea out of white pine needles. Is that true? Making tea out of pine needles is kind of a, I don't want to sound condescending here, but it's kind of a get back to nature fad. Uh, it's easy to do, but it's full of terpenes. <laughs> so it's not good for you to, to do that. To have a little taste of it, fine. You know, add some lemon and honey, it's really good. Yeah. But not to do regularly. There are many more things that you can get a much safer tea from. The terpenes are the problem. Yes, sir. Mark, are there large stands of white pine in the Chattahoochee forest? Yeah, you road? can't, you probably can't walk for more than Keep going. Uh, yeah. 10 minutes anywhere without running into white pine. Probably it's not. so common there. And uh, they get quite large. Like I said, they're the tallest tree in the east. So, you know, there are white pines that are this big. 
up in the na national forest. The Cherokees were the most part North Georgia. Um, you you do bring up an interesting point though. But you, you familiar with fat lighter or fat wood? You know what that is? Mm -hmm. It's a certain wood that people look for in the forest that has just an extra flammability to it. It's it's really phenomenal because you know even if you strike a match and you know matchsticks are usually made out of some wood that burns really well. Obviously, they want your match to burn well. But if you hold a mat a struck match like that with the flame here. What happens to that flame every time it goes out because heat goes up and it can't heat up what's below it. But with fat wood, a little splinter that you can hold it like a candle. It'll keep burning because it draws the fuel to it. Well, in South Georgia, it's long leaf pine that supplies that. And in the mountains, it's Virginia pine. So there's a different pine tree in different areas that provides you with the fat lighter. Who else has a question? Well, there's one on the um, chat that says, what is the name of the flute? It's called a love flute. <laughs> <laughs> and then a comment from Donna that the range is Minnesota to Georgia. She must have looked good old Google. Thanks, Donna. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> It's easy, easy to do. Uh, sassafras is a very common tree in the mountains. Uh, it's common here too, but all you need to do is dig down next to a sassafras tree and take a section of its rhizome. It's one of those trees that primarily reproduces by an asexual <coughs> spreading of an underground stem called a rhizome and what comes up are clones there are lots of plants like that you know that's why one of the largest organisms that we know of is those aspen trees that you hear about or or those mycelia that live in one area you know one organism but once you get a piece of that just plant it it'll come up because plants that that reproduce mostly by rhizomes are easy to transplant who else has a question? So is root beer artificial now? <laughs> oh yeah, sure. But you can still make it with the real stuff too. Another tree that has lent itself to root beer is black birch, sweet birch. It's also got a, it's, it has a, actually a wintergreen flavor to it, but people associate that with root beer also. Yes. With the red maple um, that you talked about for burns, would that work for like skin knees or any kind of thing? No, nope. it if, if it's a friction burn during that skin knee. Yes it will help for the burned part of the tissue. And this, the red maple is the solution to that. Well, thank you for having me today. Thank you. Delightful. Um, and I'm sorry we couldn't get through the whole presentation. Was there a whole lot left or? You could probably talk all day long. <laughs> well, maybe we can have you back again for the second half. Okay. Uh, all right. I would like to say one last thing. All the books over here are yes. for sale, and the volume one of Secrets of the Forest contains the kind of stuff that I'm talking to you about today. Great. Um, three other volumes have subjects that you might be interested in. So have a look over. And there. volume one is this one that we're going to be doing for our book club in October. So get one today, read it over the summer, and we'll be 